this is a September update of my permaculture backyard. This is one of my main crop gardens. I have three of them right now. This area here that's fenced in represents 15 feet square. And I've got five primary beds and I have another bed that's alongside with a lot of uh, wild plants. And the first bed, and they're doing very well. I should pull a couple of them here because they're getting pretty big. Maybe I can thin some out and let you see what one looks like here. Well, we got one with mouse damage. So we'll pull this one right here. So this is a golden beet. Really nice, luxurious leaves. And uh, a lot of people eat the leaves, but these have a lot of slug damage, so I put it right back in the soil. It's pretty nice. Look at it. Okay, we have red beets. I'll pull one of these. That's a really nice one too, look at. And I also have parsnips in here, but I'm gonna leave those continue to grow. And we have some wild plants growing. I've been harvesting some of that stinging nettle, but not this time. This is a parsnip right here. We've got a lot of yellow clover growing in here to replenish the beds. Region. And then in this row, we've got potatoes, a lot of potatoes. We have more beets. We harvested a lot of radishes out of here already, onions and peas. And some of these potatoes be close. This one here is dead, so let me see if we, we can find it here. If I can find where it was. There's a lot of plants in here, so we should be getting a good amount of these. That's a purple Peruvian potato. So this bed represents my yakon, and this one is nearly as tall as I am. It's getting close to six feet. And um, I planted 12 plants in here that I actually started growing in the wintertime in my house and they're really solid plants. And there's a lot of tillers that came up on the edges so there might be 20 or 25 plants in here now. This is going to be one thick mound of yakon. <laughs> here we are on the other side of the yakons. In this bed is a companion planting of carrots and leeks and they're doing very well. You can see these leeks are growing very tall. They're getting very thick. And uh, the very biggest ones I'm gonna leave to continue to grow to see how big they get. But let me see if I can take one out of here that's kind of medium size and where it can be using a little thinning anyway. So those two are pretty close. So we'll take this one out of here, right here. There's a nice leak. Look at Growing very well. Okay, now I got a lot of carrots in here, so let me pull a carrot. I did catch a woodchuck in here, and they took out some of the leaves here of the carrot, so I'm gonna take one or two of those. Oh yeah, look at that. That's a nice one. And these are primarily storage carrots here, so I'm gonna let them go. And then the last bed here, which is right up tight against the fence, I've got a chira, which is a tropical plant that you can eat the leaves and the roots and the stems. And I've been eating on the leaves. They're not necessarily very good. They're okay, they're kind of a, a non-taste. So we'll harvest some of those roots one of these days and we'll see how they turn out there. And then I've got black beans. Now here's a black bean. This is second generation on my property. See the bean there, it's black. Okay. And I also have some squash in here, and there's kiwi, and they're, they're immature, they're only, uh, this is their second summer. There's blackberries, now there is a blackberry here I can harvest. This is a little one. Normally they're a lot bigger than this. Got some comfrey, 
more blackberries. I got grapes, and these are just about start, starting to get ripe. Actually, these are ripe. This is the first I'm harvesting off of this. This, these are Reliance, seedless Reliance. Oh, I got this volunteer potato plant. I can see potatoes sitting up above the ground. I think these are special potatoes because I didn't plant them. They're volunteers. <laughs> so this, the, the potato that grew this plant stayed in the soil all winter last winter, which was a very bad cold winter with hardly any snow cover. So I think this is a very special potato. I'm going to save all these and replant those this fall in one of these beds. We'll see if we'll keep that going. So here's the harvest that I just made. And I didn't dig up any yakons. We'll let them go. You'll see them in about three weeks. I'm going to dig the whole bed up. So let's off to our next adventure. There's my water tank. I collect rainwater off of the garage. And here is a trellis of kiwi and a wild grapevine. And the wild grapevine is meant to grow up over the top of the garage and also shade these kiwi, which are Arctic Beauty, Red Beauty, and I think there's also another variety or two in here. On the ground level, we have asparagus growing. First year asparagus plants. We have a number of plants here that I just recently purchased from the Wisconsin Permaculture Convergence from McCall. He's a longtime permaculturalist from the west side of Wisconsin. And the, most of the plants there are pawpaws, but I also have some buffalo berry and grape plant. I have two primary beds in this main crop garden. On this side, I've already harvested a lot of radishes and onions. And now I have a few beets left in here, and I've got nine potato plants. And I just noticed here one plant, so oh, actually there's another one here. They're sprouting new leaves. So I got these old leaves that are kind of drooped down around and they're getting underneath the radishes and coming up away from the roll so that they could get sunlight. Well, now they're growing some new leaves right in the center. And hopefully that results in more potato production. And then all this green is a buckwheat, and it's primarily to feed the soil. I'm going to let it all go back into the soil, but also secondarily it's a cover crop. And I really don't want my beds to dry out, so even though I'm not growing much, I'm going to continue to keep them uh, moist. Keep the soil life up high. We've harvested a lot of radishes out of here already, and onions. And we got beets growing in the center, very big ones. I've already picked a couple, I don't want to pick any more. And then i got a row of radishes on the side. On the ends are radishes and potatoes, and then all the way along the outside are purple Peruvian potatoes. In the back I have my grandma's onions and they're all re-sprouting already and I gotta break them apart because I planted 12 onion bulbs in here and each one split into at least five and I see some that look like there's eight or nine of them and I gotta break them apart so they don't start to crowd each other. This is my asparagus plant uh, bed in the back and I grew peas with it and they grew very well. On this side we have kiwis and service berries. And then here's our garden fence between the two main crop gardens, and I've got grapes. Grapes. That's really good. That's sweet. Oh, they're really sweet. Mmm, here's a nice bat. These are Reliance seedless grapes. After the winter last year, uh, below zero temperatures, 20 below I think was the coldest, and no snow cover to insulate the ground, these things shouldn't even be growing this year. And look at this. I'm harvesting a big handful. Oh, there's more over here. I miss these that are lower. These are eating grapes. They're just, you just really, you got to eat them fresh. Eat as many as you can. Let me show you. And I still have a black raspberry up here that I got to get out. And then I have basil, cilantro, and more asparagus in the front here. Look at these. Seedless Reliance grapes here in Wisconsin. In our path corridor here leading to the shed door, we have josta berries and asparagus and chives. And I allowed that thistle to grow and there's some milkweed. That's all good. You can see in here we're drying onions and garlic and 
all kinds of goodies from the garden. They're, they're dry enough now. But it's going to take me some time to get at it. And I started getting the blight, and I began to water them with comfrey tea. You see the blight has really got pretty strong on some of these branches here. But as I started to water them, look at this. They're, they're beginning to grow some new plants, new leaves. So I don't think the comfrey water cured them of the blight, but definitely I'm going to say that it encouraged them to make new growth here. Though I haven't harvested too many tomatoes yet, I did catch a ground squirrel in here eating them. So, uh, and I noticed the last couple days no ground squirrel damage and maybe that's because of the smell of the comfrey tea. So comfrey tea might have a couple of different uses here. Both as amendment, adding nutrients to the soil and as a pest deterrent. Also some borage in here. Mmm. Wow, oh, these grapes are something special. Now this is my fruit fence area. Behind me I got goji berries and blueberries and mulberries. And there's berries all along the fence as well as grapes and blackberries. I've been harvesting blackberries. Concord grapes are not ready. I do have a couple of bunches, which I think is pretty good for uh, two-year-old plants. There's a bed of honeyberries here. More blueberries and comfrey along the fence line and blackberries. Oh, it smells really good here. Got cilantro in here and basil. Now this is the entire area has been dedicated to kohlrabis, primarily, secondarily cabbages. And this particular row is an experiment. I've got parsnips in the middle. Now these parsnips should be a lot stronger than this by this time of the year but they've been shaded out by the kohlrabi and I've been having to really work hard to cut the leaves off. And now they're coming. I don't know if they're gonna be a huge crop, but the frost doesn't kill them. So they're gonna grow all the way until the ground freezes, which will be, I think, December this year because of that huge pool of warm water in the Pacific Ocean. And these kohlrabis are just monsters. They're just monsters. I'm already, I've got a few of them over 10 pounds, I'm sure. And, um, I think they can grow as big as 20 pounds and that's what I'm aiming for. Now in this area here I actually had them a lot densely, more densely planted. I've been trimming them out as I go and eating them. So this bed here is finished. I'm going to let this go now until the ground freezes and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten kohlrabi in here. And then we got the lineup of parsnips. One other thing to mention that it's not scientific, it's just an observation for this year. These kohlrabis in the center don't have any slug trails on the kohlrabi. The slugs try to eat through the skin of the kohlrabi and can't and leave like a little scar. And the roll next to it, now they're all scarred up. I think these parsnips might have something to do with that. But I don't know for sure. We'll have to do some more experiments next year. On this side of this main crop garden, you can barely distinguish the outlines of the rows because of these milkweeds and borages and Ah, burdock behind me, but let me uh, let you make you aware there we're, we're definitely making cabbages and kohlrabis in here, although the cabbages are a little weak. That's okay, I'm going to make sauerkraut out of them. And I got a couple of really large kohlrabi right here that are really close, and normally I've been thinning them out so that they're uh, farther apart than that. So I'll go ahead and I'm going to take one of these. Let me show you what a real kohlrabi looks like. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. I don't want to get it in there. Where is it? Where is that stem? I see it. I see it. There it is. You gotta use the lopers. <laughs> That's what I'm using to cut them. Look at this. <laughs> oh, this is just the first of September. Look how big that sucker is. I'll have to weigh that got to be pushing 10 pounds. So I'll take these stems off and then I'm going to show you what I mean by the slugs leaving scars. You see the scars on them. The slugs are trying to eat it and they can't get through the skin. It is leaving scars. And I assure you these are very juicy inside and they are not woody. <laughs> So 
So this dense bed right here is Jersey Giant Asparagus. This is its first year. I just planted it this spring and they're doing very well. I don't think any of them died. I think they all came up. We did have a little tussle with uh, some weeds and I pulled the weeds out and now they're just growing luxuriously. So uh, we're good to go here. We're going to let this go three years and the fourth year we're going to begin the harvest. In the forefront here I'm going to have a, a trellis for grapes and it's kind of slanted. And I also have Josta berries already planted underneath in the shade, or the future shade. And this particular specimen is a red rome. And good thing the branches are supple. It's got a load. <laughs> There's a nice view of the Golden Delicious. And right there is Sweet 16. This is my Gooseberry Hill. This is a hugo culture that was built out of rotted balsam fir and cedar. And the gooseberries really took to it. I had a massive harvest of gooseberries. I just couldn't keep up eating them. And if one thing I did learn, you gotta let them ripen. They're a little tart if you pick them before they're ripe. But once they become ripe, boy, they're just delicious. The kiwi trellis, there's a nectarine tree that grew very tall. That's after two years of very brutal winter conditions and deer browsing. I put a fence around it this year so the deer couldn't top it and boy it just shot right to the moon there. It's at least 12 feet tall already. It's almost growing like a bush. I think I'm going to encourage it to grow like a bush, see what happens. So that's a cherry tree that's growing more like a bush. And next door we have a honey locust. Doing quite well. Behind this elderberry are a row of Antonovka apple rootstock and I actually grafted them all and eight of them succeeded and four of them I'll regraft next year. <laughs>